From Valdez, Alaska, in the heart of the Chugash Mountains, World Championship Skiing takes on a new meaning on TSN. The 1992 World Extreme Skiing Championships are brought to you by Coors Light, the right beer now. By Goodyear, from tune-ups to tires, by Mountain Goat, for people who know where they're going and why. By Powder Magazine, the Skiers Magazine. And by Nikon Sunglasses, changing the way you look. The locals call it the last frontier, this place, and maybe it is, sitting at the very top of the world, a land of ice and snow. Anchorage is the largest city of the largest state, sitting on Alaska's south shore at the head of Cook Inlet. 150 miles east of Anchorage is Valdez and the Chugash Mountains. Here, nature is all pervasive. The Valdez Inlet, as James Cook first saw it some 300 years ago, Surrounded by the peaks of the Chugash, where the Thompson Pass offers by helicopter a way in into what has become a mecca for skiers who push it to the farthest, who seek the very edge, who've become extreme. The competition is simple. Day one, a single run down 42 mile peak. Day two, a double run on 27 mile glacier. Day three, two runs down Loveland. And after that, the survivor gets the trophy. And nobody knows the test better than former women's extreme skiing champion, Kim Reichel. As each of the competitors are taken to the top of the mountain by helicopter, they have to choose a line from top to bottom that best suits their skiing style. They're judged in six categories. The degree of difficulty in which of the line they choose from top to bottom, the aggressiveness in which they ski that line, their technique, their particular form or style, the air, how much air do they catch, and are they in control? Control is a really big factor. Any air has to be landed, and skiing has to be in control from top to bottom. 
And the last quarter category is fluidity. How well does the run flow from top to bottom? Because this is a judged competition, it's very subjective. What each of the judges want to see is slightly different. For me, I come from a racing background. I like to see really good, strong technique. Air isn't as important, and if air is caught, it needs to be landed cleanly. The athlete always needs to be in control. Control and fluidity are the, are the numbers that I score the highest on. The athlete has a really good run, they're in control, fluid from top to bottom. That's what I like to see, and that's what extreme skiing is all about, is being in control. Extreme skiing as a sport may be new, but the concept stretches back to the 1960s. People like Sylvain Soudan, Patrick Vellasson, and Jean-Marc Boivin, skiers who have always sought that perfect run, the perfect rush, the heart-stopping thrill. These were the men who pioneered the sport in places like Peru, the Himalayas, and the Alps, where they first climbed the mountain and then searched for first descents. It was a pure sport, unencumbered by judging. The World Extreme Skiing Championships are only two years old, but already they are the standard of excellence for the growing number of winter warriors who dream of taking it right out to the edge of the rim. These heroes of the past are now the legends of today. Sudan still skis the Himalayas, now at age 55. But others who accompanied him on so many downhill journeys have not survived this ultimate test of survival. Every day, weather permitting, all winter long, and winter is long in Valdez, busloads of skiers head east, up the Thompson to the Chugash Range. Their destination is obvious, the mountains. An average annual snowfall of 500 inches keeps them coming back. But that's not the whole story of this busy community. Valdez has always been a fishing port. Salmon abound both on a commercial and sport fishing basis. More than a few trophy pink silver and king salmon have been taken from these waters. Named after the Spanish explorer who discovered this ice-free port in 1790, it wasn't until a century later that Americans found it to be a stepping stone to the legendary Yukon Gold Rush. Then in the 1960s, the Alaska oil fields were discovered and the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was built. The result? Valdez now hosts the Alaska Pipeline Terminal. A huge facility, it seems to dominate this fine port. But as great an impact for the region as the terminal has been, the area is still the refuge to incredible wildlife. It's the home to eagles and bears, to sea lions and otters, seals, dolphins, a myriad of whales and birds, and all other manner of wildlife. In Valdez, you can pick a bouquet of wild flowers, climb a rock face, run a wild river, or just sit and take it all in. And in April, the world's hottest skiers assemble to decide the main issue, who is the boss? But on day one of the competition, that's a simple question to answer. It's the weather. 27 Mile Glacier, the original starting venue, is simply unskiable. Weather conditions are monitored, but the hard decisions are left to the experts. Well, ultimately, I think that decision falls in the hands of Walt, the uh, helicopter pilot with the A-Star, because uh, uh, he's the one that's going to be doing, moving all the competitors and, and the rescue people for the actual event. And on this day, Walt decides the chopper won't touch down on the glacier. But this chopper jockey's a gamer. He heads to 42 Mile Peak, and day one is salvaged. 2,000 vertical feet at 40 degrees. Not your average weekend ski resort, and not a chairlift in sight. This mountain is for extremists only. 
And if you're still not convinced, check out the so-called trail. This is what the skiers will face. This is the first test. And everything has to be just so. Safety and judging needs are met by the ground crew while the skiers are shuttled to the top. Leading the pack, Doug Coombs from Jackson, Wyoming. He won it all last year. Heading the chase pack, Californian Dean Conway, the first ever U.S. extreme champ. Pat McIntyre, Tahoe Terror. He took second at the Crested Butte, Colorado U.S. championship. John Hunt, a 28-year-old veteran of the mountain. He'll be there. Utah native Jim Conway, back for a second shot at the Chugach Mountains. He took eighth last year. There's Scott Kennett, a sixth place finisher a year ago. Coloradan Garrett Bartell, he could be a factor, sixth at Crested Butte. Darren Mattingly from Anchorage, the hometown favorite. And Kristen Ulmer, who leads the women into head-to-head -head competition with the men. She too a US champion. Emily Gladstone will also be heard from. This Wyoming veteran has all the tools. And Whistler BC's Wendy Brookbank, hoping to carry the Maple Leaf to glory. First off the mountain, John Hunt, and it's he who will choose the first line. His run will set the pace. Hunt's trademark is fluid style and outstanding conditioning, and both would become factors on this run down 42 mile peak. His non-stop style is judge-pleasing. This run would put John in the hunt. But at the end of his run, he'd do the hardest thing in sport. Sit and wait and watch as the field followed his tracks. Next up, Jim Conway. He'd been here before and knew what was expected. From the very top, he was out to impress the judges and decided early to try something different by choosing a unique path down the mountain. I chose this one because it was, uh, it was real beautiful. Um, here I'm just working over towards the edge. I, couldn't, I, I hadn't really studied the lower part because I didn't think the, that chute was going to go from the bottom. So I'm just kind of working over the edge, um, looking for um, yes. some air or something off this side back towards the judges and uh, just kind of keep looking. Got down here, looking a little closer. A little better snow, it would have been a good, a good deal, but it's kind of marginal, so I said, nope. And um, so I went around the other side and uh, found a little hump over there to play with. Nice and steep little line there, a little bit of air. Yeah, here I was feeling good uh, physically. It was, I was, uh, you know, I could have gone a lot, a lot more. This was, uh, it was difficult skiing, but uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, just catching some little arrows here, getting ready to head for the willows. Um, just kind of fun, like, like skiing slalom once you get in there. A little bit of air, a lot of nerve, and terrific form all combined to give Jim a tremendous run, and the judges agreed as Jim scored big. That brought Bruce Griggs, Anchorage native and crowd favorite, to the edge. He decided to follow Conway's lead, but that's where all similarity ended. Back at the top, Kristen Ulmer took a look and decided on a different tack. Went uh, a little bit over the handlebars, but I, I didn't crash. I managed to get it back together and started taking some turns down. And uh, tunnel vision just kept on going down. Uh, conditions were different um, for every single turn, really. There were a couple turns in there that were icy and I felt like I was skidding on a lot of the turns because it had really set up. I think once the sun started going down too, it, it uh, set up even more and was even firmer. So um, 
but there were two turns right down that main chute that were very icy, and so I decided to cut off to the left from the main chute so I didn't encounter any more uh, severe ice like that, and then started skiing down, and I was getting tired. Um, I wasn't so much out of breath because the altitude isn't that bad, but uh, my legs cramped up, you know, first run of the day, and I've uh, been standing around for a long time. So um, started kind of ha hacking at the bottom, really, just trying to hang on, making it to the woods as fast as I possibly can. <laughs> Garrett Bartell loves to push the envelope. A daredevil at heart, he looks for one thing and one thing only, the spectacular. So here I jump off, check my speed, jump again over a little drift, and have to stop there for a second. Setting up for this lower line. And when jump turns down, I want to do this double jump that I'm approaching now. The first one, the second one, land, ch checking my speed there, and then I'm trying to check it back again. A little bit too much speed, not quite enough strength left. So, <clears throat> so now I'm just regaining my composure a little bit and trying to look for a line. The snow conditions were real variable in here, real variable, so there was where there was glacier exposure, it was almost ice on the one side, and then it was kind of, it wasn't too bad right in the middle, and then it was real soft and, and breakable on the other side, so it was very variable. That's a good run right there. Uh, a little loss on control, but not too bad. That loss would cost him. The degree of difficulty, though, counted big and Bartell wound up in sixth place on 42 Mile Peak. So after day one, Jim Conway had the lead. Wyoming Mountain man John Hunt was second, with John Goot third. Alaskan fans were happy, Anchorage's Darren Mattingly caught fifth, and the women were well represented, with Kristen Ulmer and Emily Gladstone holding down top 20 positions in 18th and 19th respectively. Some skiers celebrated, others nursed bruised limbs and egos, but all looked ahead to the tough way down the glacier tomorrow. Meanwhile, some on hand found a more graceful way to get off this peak. Day two, a slightly for the better weather change brought this run back online. And the safety team, the officials, the fans, and most importantly, the skiers headed back to the top. What they saw falls in the, are you kidding me category? On your left, the skiers right, a run they call cauliflower, sort of a tribute to monster moguls. Their other option, to the left, the rock garden. No place for people with an aversion to running into huge slabs of granite. The weather was better, but still far from ideal. The wind at the top checked in at 40 knots. No picnic for a chopper pilot, but just perfect for driving the snow, granular and hardened, into your face with the fury of a desert sandstorm. Yet up here in the extreme world, that translates into a great day for skiing. Doug Coombs, in a pack at the back of the field, drew leadoff honors. No bonus on this mountain. He descended knowing that he needed a superb effort to get back into the hunt, and that it had to be done in the face of winter's worst. Coombs turned it up a notch and managed to find a line down the mountain. about Doug Coombs is he makes the most difficult scheme look practically easy. Then, with everyone suitably impressed, he made a champion's decision and turned it up again, this time into the rock garden. Moving at incredible speed, he blew through the granite and onto a radical slope. 
extremely fine skiing. incredible line on the mountain. That's what helped him win this contest last year. It's so impressive. Oh, incredible recovery. Outside ski got caught in the snow. It's because he's so well balanced. You actually use your mind quite a bit. You're planning, you're, you're negotiating, you're you're thinking about what you're doing, and all of a sudden you have 100% concentration on what you're doing. It's 100%. And when you do, when you have that 100%, that's when you have your best runs. That's when you're skiing your best. You can have 100% all day long some days. That's even better. Or, or you know, you just forget about everything. You just, you're there, you're skiing, you're feeling the snow, and you know how to get down in the best way possible that that your ability will allow. Entering events and ski races, you know, if you. That, that's how you support your uh, ski bum life because a lot of times you'll enter a ski race or ski event and uh, sometimes there'll be three in one weekend where I live in Jackson Hole. They'll have three in one weekend. You have a telemark race, you have a pro race, you'll have some other dumb race and you, and you have to weigh the odds and you go, okay, the best prizes are in this race. That's the one I'm going for. And that's when I have the best chance for. And then when you come to a contest like this up here in Valdez, then the, uh, you don't know. It's all this big group of people that you don't know. You, you know that they're good skiers, that's why they're here. So you watch them, they watch you, everyone talks. But all the talking stops once you're turning. The turns make the talk. And that brought out the competitive side of John Hunt, the leader after day one. And his trademarks, fast, fluid and fearless. His line choice left them gasping. John Hunt clearly doesn't get intimidated by either his rivals or the mountain. This all-out blast down the face served notice that he was hungry for the victory, and nothing went unnoticed. The judges made sure of that. A final speedy descent, a couple of perfectly carved turns, and a final tour in front of the judging stand was all that remained for John Hunt. And they saw it as the best run of the day. But Jim Conway wasn't at all impressed, and he chose an even more amazing line. Basically, I was thinking, um, you know, I had a big decision to make whether to go over to Cauliflower or to the Rock Garden first run. Um, I could see the way the Cauliflower was running. It was starting to get really tight up in top, and maybe a little side slip from some of the competitors where your tails tend to hook and grab, uh, tips and tails. Um, so I decided to do... Um, go check out the rock garden first. I actually went up about 40 minutes early and basically skied the whole rock garden on an inspection run and then hiked back out. Um, so I knew exactly where I was gonna go. And it was a good smooth fluid line. The snow was, uh, had a crust on it, but it was real breakable. There was some fun little airs uh, to pop in there um, and uh, a good air entrance out. And then I cut over to this other chute that nobody had been into yet. Um, just a real fun, line that just kind of meandered down the hill. Really nice, yeah. innovative move. Ski the line nobody else has skied before. It's always nice to see. And in the end, Conway was happy, and the judges were impressed by his flair and daring his mastery of the extreme art. Next on the mountain, Dean Conway, who takes a line to the skier's left away from the trouble of cauliflower. The reigning 1992 U.S. champion takes what he calls the shoot. It's a line that's both fluid and fast. And Conway's style epitomizes that of the extreme skier. Um, it's more of my style of skiing. That's what I like to do. You know, I like the tight shoots. I like doing big airs. 
And I love skiing steeps. It's, it's where it's at. You know, it's more exciting than just skiing some mogul field or, you know, or some flat groomed run. You know, I've been skiing so long that I really don't get any excitement out of that anymore. I have to actually have to jump off a big cliff or ski some tight, tight shoes to get any enjoyment out of skiing anymore. I think for going over rocks, you need a good, solid skiing background. You really do. You don't just ski two or three years and say, well, I'm going to start jumping cliffs. If you do that, you're asking for trouble. You need at least a good 10, 15 years of skiing background. It's solid skiing every day, not a weekend warrior, but an everyday skier. Skiing extreme, it's kind of hard to define. You know, a lot of people have different opinions of what extreme skiing actually is. Some people think it's a lot of big airs. Some people think it's skiing tight shoots. I myself think it's it's everybody out there, you know, skis extreme in their own way. You know, they're pushing themselves to the right, to their edge, and that's extreme. For some people, it might be jumping off an 80-foot cliff. For other people, it might be skiing a groomed run, and that's what I call extreme. And the leaderboard reflected an extreme change. Hunt and Conway switched places. Coombs was right there. Alaskan Darren Mattingly was holding up the home team, while Lake Louise's Kirk Jensen slipped into fifth place. And BC's Wendy Brookbank put in a great performance on the peak. Day two, run two, when the World Extreme Skiing Championship returns on TSN. Nikon, changing the way you look. Flashing the language of extreme skiing with one gnarly dude, extreme skier Pat McIntyre. Uh, in extreme skiing, there's a there's a language um, all in its own that that you basically have to get a description for what it is. Um, there's there's words like uh, gnarly, for instance. Gnarly is when uh, you got this line that's extremely difficult, and it may be full of rubble, and it's it's just kind of kind of a mess, it's kind of ugly to ski it, and so that would be gnarly, okay? Another word is, um, is aggro, okay? Aggro is, is basically short for aggravated, and that's when you attack a line extremely aggravated, and that's when you get aggro and you go at it. Flash is another word uh, that I like to use. When you, when you approach a line and you just ski right down at fall line very aggressively, as if you'd skied there many times before, and that's called flash in a line. One of my uh, favorite words that's really popular right now is sick. When, when something is sick, it's when it's practically undoable. It's out of the question for any common person to ski this kind of a place, and that's what we call sick, okay? If you get too sick, then you end up, you end up doing something like a starfish, which means you're flying down the hill, you know, with your arms and legs flying out, doing cartwheels down the mountain because you got too sick and you crashed, okay? Uh, at the bottom of that, you have what's called a yard sale. Basically, when you've wiped out and your equipment is spread out all over the place, like when you see people with their yard sales, there's just gobs of garbage all over there trying to sell. Well, that's what it looks like when someone crashed and did the starfish and ended up in it with a yard sale of his equipment all over the place, usually busted. Okay, so you put it all together and you pick this really sick line that you want to flash. So you approach it, you look over the edge, you get all aggro, you jump in there, you flash the line, something went wrong, you hook the tip, you end up doing an egg beater mixed with a starfish, and it ends up being a yard sale at the end of it. On the peak, and Emily Gladstone finds her line. Just down this bunny run, the couloir. I've heard the snow's good and thought I'd just ski it smooth rather than get out into something that I start having trouble with. Good luck. Thanks. This bunny run falls away on a 40 degree angle. Some bunny run, sort of like skiing down the roof of a church. And then throw in for a little extra obstacle, the varying snow conditions. 
Trying to do this at high speed will keep your mind alert. And Emily's motivation is purest. She's in the sport just for the joy of the run. I think of the contest for as a festival rather than a competition. It just brought everybody together and we all get to ski together and see what other people are skiing like, which is really inspiring because you know, people are from all over the place and you never get a chance to meet up with half these people that you hear about and see in pictures and it's just a lot of fun to meet everybody and ski together. And once in a while to really win a run is, is pretty exciting because it means that somebody went out there and had a pretty spectacular run and they skied everything fluid and it was difficult terrain and it's really inspiring to watch that. And the judges were inspired by watching Emily. Her fluid non-stop ride down the bunny run got 21.82 and had a shot at a decent placing in the standings. At the top, Garrett Bartell, a daring downhiller with a taste for life at the edge. Oh, this is everyday fun pretty much. Uh, having a time on it's a little bit different and it's a little bit more of an endurance race than I'm used to, but as far as the technical stuff, jumping off stuff, that's what we live for. So. That's where I'll have my fun. Near the bottom when I'm tired, that's not so fun. <laughs> the fun at the top, no fun at the bottom theory, proved to be short-lived. Bartel's run started smoothly. He cruised to the edge, paused, chose his line, and went for it. And what came next was the scariest 30 seconds of his life. And my ski kind of got into a hole. My ski was stuck, so that's when I lost my balance. And just sliding at the top there, trying to get my feet underneath me. At this point, I knew I wasn't going to uh, recover anytime soon, so I just kept on sliding and tried to just stay relaxed. I stayed conscious through the whole thing, and I just tried to stay as light as I could so that I wouldn't really nail a rock or anything like that. So I really just ended up with the stitches in my head and the broken leg, I guess fairly lucky considering I went seven, 800 feet or whatever, I guess. I've jumped off of cliffs ever since I was a young kid. And this is really the first time I've really had a bad accident. Um, I think it's a great ground for people uh, you know, the type of skiing that we do to show what they can do. And it's really only come about in the last couple of years, and I think it's a great proving ground, you know, for, for the sport. Um, I think it's a great spectator sport. As far as my crash, you know, it, it was a bad one, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it should hold anybody else back. And, you know, I'll still be skiing. I'll be out there. Extreme optimism and extreme luck. A trend developed on the leaderboard after two days with Hunt and Conway pulling away. Mattingly delighting the hometown fans in a dogfight with Albertan Kirk Jensen and John Goot. Gladstone and Ulmer hit the top 20 with solid runs on the peak. Mountain Goat, for people who know where they're going and why, gives us a freeze frame feature on Big Air with Dean Conway, U.S. champion. You know, as far as like doing these Big Airs, myself, I use, I use a long, uh, slightly longer ski. It's, it's, a, it's a KT Super G ski, about a 212. This longer ski allows me to land these bigger airs because I don't have a little short ski springing me all sideways in the air and that kind of thing. My bindings are Solomon binding. Of course, they're set at like 24. These bindings, if they, they will not come off. If they did come off in some of those areas, very possible a major injury. So you don't want your ski gear to come off. Very important. But to set your bindings at, at these kind of levels, you can't, you can't ski for two years and go, well, I'm going to set my bindings at 24 and jump off some cliff. You're going to hurt your legs. I, myself, never had a leg injury. Never. I have no injuries from this sport whatsoever. Um, and I think that comes from years of skiing background, racing, teaching, coaching, and that kind of thing. You just don't get out here and just go, I'm going to jump off a cliff. 
because you can break your back, your legs, any part of your body. At last, the mountain called Loveland and the third and final element of the championship. A check with the weather office confirmed what the judges and competitors like Scott Elder of BC already knew. Conditions on the mountain were perfect. This would be an extremely fine day, and all was ready. Loveland Mountain is as imposing as they come. The final day's two runs were set on a course that drops 1,800 feet at a 55 degree slope. A great place for a mountain goat, but a little imposing, even for the pros. Okay, we got Doug Coombs on course. He's on a rope. Skiing a totally unique line with a rope. Off. A big rock rubble. Unique line. Mountaineering should be included with skiing, and skiing should be included with mountaineering because it's all part of it. If you're going to go for the big extreme, you got to know how to use ropes, you got to know how to use all the, the gear. And uh, so that's why Jim Conway and I decided to do a rappel. We could have skied around that knob and gotten in like a lot of people did, but why not go right over the top just, to, just for something to do? Doug's fluidity is always really high, and it shows here how he just keeps his turns coming. He doesn't pause in between each turn. I like to see that. Just trying to make it smooth, fast, quick, and efficient. I didn't want to pick around. I got tired of that, watching people pick around the runs. In rock climbing, they call it flashing it. When you flash a run, you just do it smooth, quick, and efficient, and you feel really good about it, and that's what I wanted to do. And that was probably my best run I had all week, was that run. Very nice technical skiing. He's always pointing his skis down the hill. His hands are driving out in front. He makes that hard, crusty snow yeah. look easy. Really nice, smooth air. And then, more air. Coombs was pouring it on in an attempt to gain respectability. And he did, moving up 10 places with a simply superb run. Whistler's Wendy Brookbank is one of the rising stars on the extreme scene, rapidly becoming one of the most respected skiers on the circuit. In Valdez, a first day fall cost her a shot at the top 10, but she skied on to win new friends and new fans. A one-time giant slalom specialist, her true spirit shone through, running at high speed and with uncanny control on this run. Wendy Brookbank loves her sport and demonstrates unbridled enthusiasm every time out. I was just up there and I looked at the sheet up there and it was all fresh snow, hardly anybody had been through it and stuff and I just jumped in and it felt really good. And I just started carving big turns and just went faster and faster and faster and just kept on pulling them down. It was just great. Really nice snow. No air or anything funky like that, but um, just really fast and really fun. Lots of snow coming down. Tons. Wendy's run put her back on the road to a top 30 placing. After two days of competition, Wyoming's Jim Zell was in a deep hole. A day one fall saw him standing in 27th place. His only hope to crack the top 10 was now to perform magic on day three. So he took the toughest line possible. And as his run progressed, it just kept getting more and more impressive. The snow being moved down the mountain by his skis gives you some indication of just how steep and how demanding this course on Loveland Mountain really is. Zell simply let it all hang out and attack the mountain. Each time he had a decision to make, he opted for the hardest course and consequently racked up the points. Air, more air, powder, crust. Zell did it all and then some. Factor in control and fluidity plus a major dose of difficulty 
and you've got the definition of the perfect run. Then it got even better. Tired and nearing the bottom of the course, Big Jim made one more gutsy decision, and the judges gasped in admiration. Woo! He just didn't quit, and even that near disaster turned into a beautiful portrait of drive and determination. Zell came down with more flair than the rest, and now it was up to the judges. Jim Zell's terrific run received the highest points in the first run. Doug Coombs repelling kept him close, with Dean Conway grabbing third. John Hunt placed fourth in the run, that enabling him to keep a firm grip onto the overall lead, while Mattingly kept inching upwards. The Anchorage native had the fans buzzing as he moved into second place overall. Emily Gladstone stood in 14th, with Kristen Ulmer 18th. And Kirk Jensen of Alberta stayed in contention in fourth, rounding off the leaderboard. When we return, a new champion will be crowned in the world of extreme skiing. The world championships enter their final run on TSN. Promotional considerations have been provided by Mountain Goat, the official clothier of the 1992 World Extreme Skiing Championships. Mountain Goat, for people who know where they're going and why. And by Nikon Sunglasses, the official eyewear of the 1992 World Extreme Skiing Championships. Nikon, changing the way you look. Okay, I got one thing to say, may the best man win, and it's either edging skills or it's gonna be hospital bills, baby. Yeah. As Darren Mattingly moved onto the course, he carried a heavy load. This local skier was carrying the expectations of the home crowd on his shoulders, plus his own. He had a chance to take the lead, and while he hadn't been a favorite going into the event, he sure was now. Clearly, Darren knows the area well, on skis since the tender age of eight, he went on to place fifth at the 1986 Junior Olympics. And he knew full well that there was only one thing to do, fly. As Mattingly moved down the course with a whole lot of snow, it was becoming obvious that this would be a great run. And it would put some pressure on John Hunt, the leader. But late in the run, fatigue always enters the picture. Darren's having some problems with his fluidity. Lots of pausing in between each turn. That'll hurt him. Setting up for some air.
not very controlled. I did ski out of it. But it was a little shaky. That was nice. Good strong jump, nice clean landing. Now he's got the rhythm he needs. Good way to finish the run. Strong, powerful, good technique. You always remember these things at the end. And a big air. It's the way to end a run. You know, he had some problems up top, but he turned it on at the end when you know they're really tired. Impressive skiing. Impressive enough to put Mattingly into a temporary lead. But back at the top of the mountain, Dean Conway. Dean had an incredible first run, and he's definitely up there with the leaders. And from this kind of skiing, you can see why. He's really aggressive. He goes for big air. But he has excellent technique. He takes chances in situations where a lot of these athletes are backing off because the snow conditions are so bad. He's picking a real, real difficult line here. Double jump, really nice. Beautiful, beautiful skiing. Dean's strength really shines. He'll score well with all the judges on this run, provided he makes it all the way down without any mistakes. It's been a great year, you know. I started at Crescent Butte, barely made it out of the semifinals, and turned around to win it. And that was a great feeling. I, mean, I came to Alaska, you know, and I didn't really come here expecting to do this well because the mountains are so new to me. It's such a big area. Um, and I got here first few days, so I was really intimidated. I really was. And um, I just tried to keep myself together and keep my head smart. And the last day, I just, you know, I felt real confident with the area, the mountains and it showed my skin, and that's where I came out and, and tried to catch up. Um, besides, this has been a great experience, it really has. Really, really nice run. Had all the elements he needs, he'll score well in all categories. And he did. His 31.99 was the second highest score of the event. Only John Hunt had done better, and that was on the glacier on day two. The run put Dean Conway into first place. But all eyes went back to the top of the mountain, John Hunt was in the position that all athletes yearn for. The championship was his to win. If he hit a good run with solid technique, it would be his. A lot of skiers would have played it safe, taken the conservative line, the bunny run. But not John. He's there to impress. And on this day, on this Whoa. mountain, it nearly cost him the title. What are his bindings set on? John Hunt just took the 1500 vertical footfall, tumbled over, front flips, and doesn't come out of his bindings. Wow. Yeah, really. Boy, if he had come out of his skis, just think what that would have done for those scores for everybody. If a ski had released, John Hunt would have been disqualified. Even having the lead, even having won two of the four previous events, it would have meant nothing. His all-or-nothing attitude almost cost him everything. total end over. Now it was up to the judges, and they agreed. Hunt was a champion.
and the proof is on the board. King of the extreme ski world this year, John Hunt. A mere half point back, U.S. champ Dean Conway. Darren Mattingly thrilled the Anchorage locals, finishing in third. John Goot and Scott Kennett grabbed fourth and fifth. Emily Gladstone and Kristen Ulmer both nailed top 20 spots. The six through 10 spots went to last year's champ. Doug Coombs followed by Jim Conway, Greg Morris, Jim Zell, and Charlie Silverton. Wendy Brookbank placed 26. And so, in typical Alaskan fashion, they gathered to toast the new world champion, John Hunt, most daring of them all, most fluid, most controlled, and above and beyond all else, a most extreme dude. The 1992 World Extreme Skiing Championships on TSN from Valdez, Alaska have been brought to you by Coors Light, the right beer now. By Goodyear, from tune-ups to tires. By Mountain Goat, for people who know where they're going and why. By Powder Magazine, the Skiers Magazine. And by Nikon Sunglasses, changing the way you look. Accommodation in Valdez was provided by the Westmark Hotel, located in downtown Valdez. The official hotel of the World Extreme Skiing Championships features the popular Wheelhouse Lounge and offers guests a splendid view of the small boat harbor. For reservations, call 1-800-544-0970 or 907-835-4391. And air transportation was provided by Continental Airlines. One airline can make a difference. Helicopter skiing by Era Helicopters. Flight scene tours. The World Extreme Skiing Championships have been a presentation of JSP International Video Productions in association with Primetime Entertainment and Sports Programming.